Hello, everyone. Welcome to this behind the scenes look for our Masterworks first concert of the year in September. This is the beginning of our 2022 2023 season, our 75th anniversary. Now, on this concert, I programmed two works, both very special works, but the, the big work on the program was actually the first piece that this orchestra ever played in 1947, conducted by Maddie Holly. That is the Symphony No. 5 by Beethoven. Yup, that symphony. Ta 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 ta! That's the piece that the minute you hear the first four notes, you and almost everyone else on the planet recognizes where it came from and what it is. It's that popular of a piece. But what makes a piece like that so popular? A piece that orchestras like the Windsor Symphony and audiences like you want to hear time and time again? Well, there are a lot of factors involved. One is the sort of legend of Beethoven. I'm sure that had something to do with it. But the piece itself is really quite extraordinary. First of all, in, in the symphony world in the early 1800s, it was typical to have four movements, fast, slow, minuet, fast. That was the gist of a symphony. Beethoven said, you know what? That's fine in terms of tempos or speeds, but not in terms of the trajectory. So he wrote the first ever what we call victory symphony. This symphony starts completely in darkness. In fact, Beethoven himself said that these four notes, ta 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 ta, thus fate knocks at the door. And through the course of this symphony, you'll be taken on a journey to the ultimate victory. Now, Beethoven wrote this over the course of about four years. His composition process was to take a um, workbook and to constantly scribble little notes in it. And this four note motive, not even a theme. So a theme is a melody. A motive is even smaller. A motive is like a building block of a melody. This motive, ta 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 ta, kept ringing in his ear and he used it throughout the entire piece as the building block for the music. So the first thing that happens is you hear ta 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 ta, alarming. Then he repeats it just slightly lower. Ta 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 ta. Then he takes those four notes and he ca starts cascading them and adding on top of each other and turning them into a melody. And that's how the first movement is built. It's really quite ast uh, astounding. And I'm sure for the first audiences, it, it was something of, of a surprise. Now, speaking of the first audience, this, first, this work was first um, performed on December 22nd, 1808. And just in case any of you think, gosh, Robert, you program such long concerts, this original concert included his Symphony No. 6, 45 minutes, his Choral Fantasy, 20 minutes, his Fourth Piano Concerto, 40 minutes, several movements of his Mass in C, another half hour, a concert aria, a uh, perfido, plus he sat at the piano and did improvisations. Now, in addition, they premiered the symphony. All of that happened on just one rehearsal, by the way, so it was a treacherous event, um, to be sure. What really made it treacherous? The heating device in the building went out just before the concert. The audience sat through a three-hour concert freezing as they heard this brand new symphony. I'm sure the symphony had an impact on them in many different ways. Don't worry, we'll have the temperature controlled here at the Capitol Theater when you come hear the orchestra play it. So the first movement, as I mentioned, is based completely on this ta-ta-ta-ta. But there's something about ta-ta-ta-ta and the shape of this. Go with me on this for a second. If you imagine this, ta 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 it's an S shape. Well, even when he doesn't use the four note motive, all of the melodies in this entire symphony are based on an S shape. That was the thing that worked all the way through it. Now this is extraordinary and to us in our modern ears, this won't seem like such a big deal, but this was extraordinary because it had never happened before that movements would be so connected with each other. You see, the symphony actually came from originally dance suites where each movement was separate and different and very much had a different feel for each movement. 
Beethoven said, no, I want to build this this way. And it was this symphony in 1808, the symphony number no. five, that set the bar for composers to this day. Now the second movement is a set of variations on a beautiful singing melody, starting out with the cellos and the violas. It's really quite exquisite. The third movement is a scherzo. Now Beethoven sort of invented the scherzo. A scherzo literally means joke. What it basically is, is a minuet, um chunk chunk, um chunk chunk, sped up. Um chunk chunk, um chunk chunk, um chunk chunk, um chunk chunk. And he was really well known for writing these scherzos. This scherzo, however, is a little bit different. It focuses almost all of its energy on the double basses and cellos, the lowest instruments of the string family. There is something completely eerie and completely otherworldly about this movement. Now, typically what you'll hear is that music, a different kind of music in the trio, and then that music comes back. That happens. But then he sneaks us into the fourth movement. He does it in a very clever way with a timpani uh, uh, set of rhythms. Ba -ba -ba -bum. Ba -ba -ba -bum. It's this most ominous feel underneath the music as the violins and the violas and the cellos, basses are all sort of meandering. Ba -ba -ba -bum. Ba -ba -ba -bum. Until finally there is this exquisite explosion and we land in the fourth movement. The fourth movement being the first time that trombones appear in a symphony orchestra on stage. It's true. Trombones up to this point were only used in operas for special effects, storm scenes and depressing kind of moments. In this symphony, he uses the trombones to really speak to the victory. In addition, he adds piccolo and contrabassoon. So the orchestra expands in the final movement of this symphony. I know you've heard it on TV and on the radio and a million times in TV commercials and in different ways, but to experience the complete Beethoven symphony live is really something extraordinary. Now that's the second half of the program. The first half of the program features a work by the Canadian composer John Burge. John Burge is a Juno award-winning composer who's the professor of composition at Queen's University in Kingston. He was commissioned in 2017 by the National Youth Orchestra of Canada to write a brand new piece for the 150th anniversary of Canada. You probably remember we did a few premieres that year as well. It was across Canada, orchestras were performing premieres everywhere. Well, this was particularly exciting to John because the National Youth Orchestra is extraordinarily big. It's over a hundred students and they were touring around Canada. So he had all of a sudden at his fingertips all of these resources of sounds. And so he was inspired to write this magnificent piece. He was also inspired by a painting by a friend of his named Maxwell Newhouse. And this painting, also called The Four Seasons of the Canadian Flag, is sort of a four-part um, well, a triptych is three, so it's a four-part fortic, whatever that's called. The first one is summer. There you have the full-on maple leaf. The second one is autumn, where the maple leaf is laying down as it would in autumn. Then in winter, no maple leaf at all. And in the fourth uh, part of this painting is um, the bud of a leaf for springtime. Well, this painting, which by the way, was done for the 10th anniversary, uh, of the Canadian flag was all that John needed to be inspired. And so he wrote this piece, The Four Seasons of the Canadian Flag. He also knew, by the way, that he was not going to have 100 plus piece orchestras to play this all the time. So along with the Saskatoon Symphony and the Kingston Symphony, he reduced the orchestration to a normal size orchestra, which is the version that we'll be performing for you. Now, the work is in four movements. In summer, this is actually the shortest movement as he depicts summer just flying by. Now, I think in some places in Canada, this is probably more true than it is here in Windsor, but there you have it, the shortest movement. In autumn, he is very introspective and he creates a lot of melodies that do this. Down, 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 that keep coming down as though the leaves are falling. 
Winter is all about contrast, and he really makes use of the percussion family. And finally, in spring, he begins small and grows, providing a resurrection of sorts of nature. The work is really enormously picturesque and evocative, and we are so looking forward to performing it for you. So I hope to see you on September 17 and 18 for a performance of The Four Seasons of the Canadian Flag by John Burge and Beethoven's Symphony No. 5.